There are three things you probably want from a method to approach the essay. Number one, how can I have a routine, a structure that always forces the examiner to give me marks? Number two, can I use that structure for the 20th century, the paper two, question two one, like an inspector calls? And number three, can I use it for all the extract questions. In other words, can I use exactly the same structure, exactly the same method, exactly the same language in order to get top grades? The answer is yes. I'm going to divide this video into three parts. I'm going to show you the what, what it is you've got to do. Then I'm going to show you the how, how are you going to do it? And then this is where the juicy grade eight and nine stuff really kicks in. That's going to persuade you is the why. Let's get started. Here's my rundown of the what. You need to start with a thesis statement. That's where you set out what your argument is going to be. And I'm going to show you in the how section that that needs to have three parts. And each of those three parts will be a different purpose that the author has. So the author will have three purposes. That guarantees that your thesis on its own will be at grade eight and nine level, regardless of what happens to the rest of the essay. But we want the rest of the essay also to be brilliant. So I'm going to jump ahead to point number five, the conclusion. When you get to the end of the essay, you're going to refer back to the thesis and those three purposes that the author had. And you're going to show how those purposes have been achieved or whether there's something new and interesting. We will get to that in the how. What goes in the middle? There are three things. Always, you will write about the beginning relating to your theme or character. Why? Well, the author has spent forever thinking about how to introduce that theme or that character, so their best thinking is there. Here's the other reason we're going to be able to follow through the changes to that theme or that character, and that will automatically make our response sophisticated. It will make it an argument. It will mean the examiner will have to give us really good marks. Then, before the conclusion, we will write about the ending. Again, this is where the writer agonises about how to finish off that theme or that character or the whole text. And so, the writer's ideas are there, rich pickings at the ending. So, by writing about the beginning and the ending, we're always going to be able to show the journey and we're always going to be able to dive deep into those three ideas the writer had that you introduced in the thesis. Now, the only bit that's left to chance now is how fast you are at writing and how well you know the text. Because let's be fair, everybody, even someone rocking up at grade two, can know the beginning and the ending of the text. It's not difficult. Then it's a question of how much you know. And in our what section, I'm going to say you only need four more events from the text, and I want you to do them in chronological order. We'll jump to that in the why. It's super important that they're in chronological order. If you don't write quickly, you might only do three events or two. Or if it's an extract question, you might just do the extract there. So non-negotiable, one, two, four, and five. This one you've got to do, but how much of it you do really depends on you. To show you the thesis statement, I'm going to give you an example from An Inspector Calls and another one from A Christmas Carol. So, in An Inspector Calls, Priestley wants to change the attitude of the audience towards social responsibility. He wants the upper classes to take responsibility for the workers and the poor and therefore produce a fairer society. That is as good a thesis statement as most students will ever write, but we can go deeper. 
He also focuses on female victims like Eva and Sheila in order to show that capitalism is also sexist and this patriarchal society needs to change to respect women. We're already on a grade eight or nine, but we can go deeper. The attack on capitalism also equates the profit motive with the desire to treat men as goods in order to earn profit in war. That is a grade nine and beyond grade nine idea in my guides. Don't worry if you haven't studied that or that. The feminism one, I'm sure you can appreciate easily. The capitalism one, equaling war, that might be for a future video. In A Christmas Carol, the three-part thesis statement will look like this. Again, the number one is going to be what every good student will write. Dickens writes Christmas Carol in order to give his readers the need for a sense of social responsibility towards the poor and the disadvantaged. That's plenty good enough for a grade eight, no bother. We can go deeper. He wants to attack the Malthusian political view which treated the poor as lazy and deserving of their poverty. Malthus, relevant to every single essay, you're on a grade nine. Three, beyond grade nine if you want, you'll see some of these ideas in my videos and guides, he also wants to change the attitude of his readers towards the pay they give to their employees. So what you'll find out in the novel is that what Bob gets paid, 15 shillings, is actually the going rate. Although Scrooge is a miser with his own money, he actually pays Bob what everybody else is paying. And that's why society needs changing to think about social responsibility. So that is a flavour of how much depth you can go into in that thesis statement and how you can force the examiner to say, this student understands the author's ideas. They have to be at least a level five or six, which is where grade seven to grade nine are. Let's look at the beginning using an example from Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet. So I know going into the exam that I want to use this quotation where Macbeth unseems his enemy Macdonald from the nave all the way to the chops. So I'm going to use that no matter what the question. If it's about violence, easy. Macbeth loves violence and is expert at it. If it's about Lady Macbeth, easy. I'm going to show how this portrays Macbeth as a valiant warrior who is going to be the opposite of Macbeth, sorry, Lady Macbeth, and how she is going to feel compelled to unsex herself later, remember, in order to become more like him, full of direst cruelty. If it's about the supernatural, then great, I'm going to say, this is why the witches pick on Macbeth and not Banquo. They're both warriors, but Macbeth is the bloodthirsty one. Okay, so there is some skill in applying your beginning to every question, but you're not going to leave that to chance. You're going to go through the past exam papers and think, how can I relate my brilliant beginning to every single question? Just like I've done with those three. Okay, let's go to Romeo and Juliet. This starts with Samson and Gregory having a bit of lad's banter. And Samson says, my naked weapon is out. Obviously, this is a stupid bit of schoolboy humour. He's referring to his sword, but by describing it as his naked weapon, he's also referring to it as his penis. So he thinks this is hilarious. Why does Shakespeare start this tragedy where people are going to be killed all over the place with a penis joke? Why? Because he's saying fundamentally, the main problem in this society is that it is patriarchal, that it's glorified male behavior, and that that male behavior is out of control. 
What starts as a joke is going to lead to blood. Remember, when Mercutio decides to fight Tybalt, it starts as a joke. Soon enough, Mercutio is killed and then so is Tybalt. So it's easy for me to fit this to any question if it's about masculinity, if it's about the immaturity of the lovers. Oh look, here's the immaturity of the society. If it's about Capulet and Juliet, I can say Capulet represents the adult version of this, male patriarchal control of women. Because at the same time that Samson is going on about this naked weapon, he's also talking about how he's going to use it against the other family's maids, the virgins from the other family. Not just fighting the men, but fantasizing about having sex with virgins. Totally unacceptable. Now, Shakespeare is writing 400 years ago. He doesn't expect his audience to think, oh yeah, good idea. He's also horrified by this way of thinking about women. So you can apply it just like the Macbeth one to every single question that comes up. Prepare it in advance. Don't leave anything to chance. Let's now jump to the ending and see if we can use it in the same way. With Macbeth, we're going to pick the final description of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. He is described as a dead butcher and she is described as a fiend-like queen. So if it's about masculinity, we have the butcher and how becoming masculine has turned Lady Macbeth into a fiend. If it is about the supernatural, well then the witches have chosen Macbeth because he's like a butcher. And this also shows his decline in status from king, ruler of the country, supposedly appointed by God, and less than human almost, but certainly much less than noble, a butcher. And that is linked to the idea that he's dead because this is good riddance. It is his fate, which society is going to rejoice at. Similarly, the supernatural, she is a queen, but she is fiend-like. So in the play, we can decide if we want to that Lady Macbeth is a witch-like, or that she too has been made subhuman by trafficking with the supernatural. If it is about Lady Macbeth, well, we can easily talk about her from that quotation, and we can show that perhaps he is responsible for her death. That is why he is a butcher. He's got no concerns about who he kills. She commits suicide because of his actions as well as hers. So not just that they've killed Duncan, but also that he's killed his best friend Banquo, and then he's killed all of Macduff's family, but not Macduff, the innocent women and children in the family, which she sleepwalks about, if you remember. So really easy to apply the ending to what Shakespeare is up to. Then we link it to his moral message, which is, this is the fate that will happen to you, to all the nobles in the audience who are watching, if you also embark on regicide by killing our gorgeous, our lovely Scottish King, King James. Right, Romeo and Juliet. So here I'm not jumping directly to the end of the play, I'm getting close to it with the end of the two lovers. That will always be relevant because you'll never get a question that doesn't involve at least one of them. And if you do, let's say you've got some bizarre question on Mercutio and Tybalt, well, it's actually a question about Romeo and his relationship with Tybalt and his relationship with Mercutio. So you see what I mean? It'll always be about Romeo and Juliet, even if it's not in the question's words. So we're going to have this. Oh, happy dagger, this is thy sheath. That's what Juliet says as she stabs herself with Romeo's dagger. Again, we return to what Shakespeare has already shown is the problem in this society, in that it is patriarchal and violently sexual. So the sheath and the dagger are obvious metaphors for you know what. I'm not going to dramatize it on YouTube because I want it to monetize me, but you know what I'm talking about. She also treats the dagger 
as happy as a part of her love for Romeo, not just because it is his dagger, but also because of what it symbolises, not just his sexuality, but the violence that is involved with it. Then you have to decide, what is Shakespeare's view of this? Does he think, yes, keep women in this subjected place? Or does he think, as I believe, that they should be treated more as equals in his Tudor society? Whichever way you decide, you're dealing with the author's ideas and therefore getting top marks. Did you notice how with both characters I talked about the change from the beginning? Whenever I talk about the change from the beginning, I'm looking at development, sophistication, argument, conceptualised stuff, I'm being convincing, the examiner's exhausted by now and said i just got to give them a top grade. I can't help myself. Okay, let's look at the middle of this top grade burger. We've had the beginning and we've had the end. Now we want to show that journey in more detail. What will happen here is because you are moving chronologically in the order in which they happen in the text, you will be seeing changes in the theme or the character all the way through. Therefore, you will be writing that convincing argument that forces the examiner to give you grade seven to nine. It's impossible to get below grade seven if you do that and successfully show the changes. Impossible. Now, what about the extract? The exam says, starting with the extract for several of the questions. Will you get in trouble? No. If you don't start with the extract, the examiners don't care. If you don't use the extract, then you will be marked down. So there is one check to do, and that is, where does my extract fit in these four events? Now, in all the questions I've ever looked at, I've only ever found one where I did my plan and I had my six events, the beginning, the four going through and the ending, my six events, and none of them were the extract. But for every other essay, the extract was in there. What do I do then if the extract's not there? Well, I just get rid of the event that's closest to it and put the extract in its place. Easy. Then I'm still going to go through chronologically, but I will deal with the extract. How many quotes do you need from the extract? I'm going to say at least two, but how many is completely up to you. The examiners don't care. There is no requirement to write a certain amount about the extract. They simply don't care. From their point of view, the extract is just a way to get you something to write about so that if you've never read the text, you can still score some marks because the extract's there in front of you. Okay, what they're really interested in is the text and how the extract links to it. So doing it this way, with your chronological plan, golden way to get marks. The other brilliant thing is you can plan these for all your texts because the events are going to be the same no matter what the question. So 80% of your exam is prepared before you go in. Don't leave it to chance, plan it in advance. If you would like to see how a student gets top marks in an essay, check out the video coming up now.